<clears throat> hey, there it is. Hi, everyone. How are you? We'll start off right with a with with a, a video. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, coming to you from uh, Jojage. Uh, which has long been a meeting point of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And uh... Mr. Bronfman. Your family has a long history of supporting anti-Palestinian and pro-apartheid positions. You instigated birthright to send North Americans to Israel, to Palestine. Your family sent weapons to the Zionist forces in 1948 that ethnically cleansed Palestinians. At this late stage in life, do you want to apologize to Palestinians? Do you want to apologize for what you've done to Palestinians? Do you want to apologize? No. You're not. You're not willing to apologize for supporting apartheid. You're not willing to. Is 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 Amnesty and Human Rights Watch wrong to say Israel's committing the crime of apartheid? Thank you for coming. Is Israel is Amnesty? Mr. Bronfman, your family has a long history of supporting anti-Palestinian and pro-apartheid positions. You instigated birthright to send North Americans to Israel, to Palestine. Your family okay. sent weapons to the Zionist forces in 1948. Wow. Mm -hmm. He's disappeared. <laughs> Oh, there you go. <clears throat> what happened with the video? Oh, there it is. No foreign military intervention in Haiti! No foreign military intervention in Haiti. Let Haiti breathe. Let Haiti breathe. No to the core group. Disband the core group. Disband the core group. Stop propping up Ariel Henry. Stop propping up Ariel Henry. Let Haiti breathe. Let Haiti breathe. Reparations for the 2004 coup. Reparations for the 2004 coup. Let Haiti breathe. Let Haiti breathe! Let Haiti breathe! Let Haiti breathe! No foreign military intervention in Haiti! Shame on you, Blinken! Shame on you, Blinken! Run away, Blinken! Run away, Blinken! Shame no foreign military intervention! So that, that was, uh, the first one was uh, Charles Bronfman. I'm not sure how, how well people saw that. Speaking at, at McGill, uh, I guess on Thursday, and then uh, Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken with uh, Melanie Jolie on Friday in Montreal. We were able to give, it was supposed to be a photo opportunity at the um, Jean Talon market, and we were able to chase him off in about 45, 50 seconds. C according to a number of reporters, the plan was then to go downstairs and and uh, meet with some uh, merchants at the market and they were of course we're not able to do that we had about 10 people inside and uh, and about a dozen or so people outside um, we were the 10 of us inside were you know shopping there was there was RCMP and probably secret service all around uh, and so we were just sort of like shopping milling about the market for uh, a little bit of time of waiting for him to appear and then uh, and then we had a pretty good uh, 
uh, a challenge to uh, his presence. So that was uh, quite a success. And it got, it got quite a bit of media. Le Devoir, La Presse, uh, Radio Canada did a report. Um, so it really was a um, successful uh, uh, disruption. And wow. Lincoln was in Canada to promote a foreign military invasion of Haiti and trying to get uh, the Canadian government to lead that mission. And uh, on the day, I guess on the Thursday, the Canadian government announced a fact-finding mission to Haiti to sort of scope out the situation for a uh, occupation. Uh, and uh, this is just to sort of, you know, this has been a, now, I guess, going on six weeks, two months, more, maybe more of sort of pre preparing the train for this, this uh, intervention with Canada, pressing the UN to pu push for intervention, the head of this, the Secretary General, pressing the OAS to push for an intervention, uh, pushing the, the issue in many different uh, forums. And now it seems like at this late date, the Canadian government at least wants to appear reluctant or reticent uh, to, to move forward. Uh, it's not exactly clear what's going on in the background, uh, but, um, but they, are, um, they are definitely uh, looking for a foreign, they want Car they clearly want CARICOM to send police and, and military to Haiti. That, that, seems, that seems clear whether CARICOM is refusing and it also appears that the UN resolution that the Americans are pushing at the Security Council is not succeeding, that, that China and Russia are blocking that, that resolution. Yesterday, a Haitian journalist, uh, Romeo Vilsaint, was assassinated in front of uh, the Delma neighborhood in port au prince uh, police station. He had been he had gone to the, the, the police station to, to uh, look for, uh, to inquire about a, um, another reporter that had been detained at a protest by the police. And what's uh, kind of, you know, sort of important, I guess, in part, I mean, the guy's killed, obviously that's important. He's a journalist that, you know, adds another layer to it. But, but, Another layer to this whole thing is that this is, you know, earlier in the day on Sunday, uh, Melanie Jolie was on Rosie Barton, or I saw it on Sunday, it may have been appeared on Saturday, but I watched it on Sunday. She's on uh, Rosie Barton, CBC, boasting about Canada's giving $40 million to Haitian police this year. But almost certainly, even though that his killing actually got was ultimately got reported on by Associated Press, the Haitian journalist killing, probably or almost certainly the Canadian officials won't say anything about this killing by the Haitian police. So this force that we pay for, arm, train, diplomatically back, when they kill protesters, and they've done a lot of that, it's almost invariably silence from the Canadian uh, uh, government. So uh, this is just a, a, um, another example of this, of how Canada has, you know, props up, supports the repre repressive apparatus of the Haitian state, yet is uh, unwilling to say anything critical uh, because that repressive apparatus is who is keeping in place this illegitimate uh, leader, prime minister that we appointed 15 months ago. In a CBC story on, uh, I think it was probably on Thursday, maybe it was Wednesday, a big long story about Haiti uh, based upon Blinken's visit to uh, Ottawa. It said in this big long story about Haiti, it says, quote, activists are demanding an end to the oppressive regime. Okay, so that's true, but in this case, the mention was not about Haiti, but was about the secondary issue in the meeting between Blinken and Jolie, which was Iran. So this long story about Haiti doesn't say anything about the uprising in Haiti. Nothing, literally nothing. There's no, there's no mass protests. It's just insecurities, gangs, cholera. The protests have now just been disappeared. 
and but there are activists demanding an end to the oppressive regime. That's just when the story transitions to last two paragraphs about Iran and other issues that Blinken were uh, and Jolie were going to be talking about. Just a remarkable uh, example of how bigger, more sustained, also violently repressed protests in Haiti are just ignored by the dominant media because it doesn't serve uh, their well. Uh, it doesn't serve the Kane government's purposes. Um, so the uh, Two days ago, I believe it was a couple of days ago, uh, the uh, the the um, parliamentary budget officer reported that uh, Canada purchasing of the surface combatant naval vessels, uh, fifteen of these vessels, is going to cost over three hundred and six billion dollars over the life cycle. It's a long life cycle; it's sixty years. That's going to be 85 billion up front. Some people believe that's an underestimate, that that's the minimum uh, up front. So it's going to be probably, people suggest it's probably going to be closer to 100 billion up front, but $306 billion over the life cycle. And uh, it's got a little bit of attention. It got, you know, some media reports, but certainly not enough. And almost no attention given to what's going to be on. Part of why they're going to be so expensive is because these naval vessels, as one uh, report, uh, uh, tech reporter put it, we're going to be brimming with missiles, including uh, Tomahawk missiles that can hit land targets 1,700 kilometers away. So that's like if you're in, uh, I don't know, if you're somewhere around uh, probably like Jamaican waters, you could fire a missile and blow up Caracas uh, in Venezuela. Might even be further than that. Uh, uh, so this is, for this $306 billion, that is a lot of social housing uh, that could be built. Another development, positive development, was yesterday in, uh, in Brazil, uh, Lula won the presidency. And uh, it was closer than, than we, one would have hoped, but it still won by maybe 2 million votes. And, uh, and this is a blow, definite blow to Trudeau's Latin America policy. And uh, this, is, this is the latest now of a whole string of social democratic leaders winning in elections from Colombia to Honduras, Mexico, Argentina, uh, Chile, you know, there's obviously uh, Peru, there's variances of these uh, politicians, but all of them are against Canada's bid to overthrow Venezuela's government. Most of them are supportive of, of the Latin American integration efforts like the CELAC, the community of, uh, of Latin American Caribbean uh, countries, and which excludes two countries. It excludes the U.S. and Canada, and it's basically potentially an effort to replace the Organization of American States. And so Lula's victory is a, you know, this is the biggest, the most important player geopolitically in the region uh, in terms of moving towards that Latin American integration uh, direction, which is threat to, uh, to US power in, uh, in, in the region. And so, you know, the, to, to his credit, Trudeau did it, uh, put out a, a tweet fairly soon after the victory came down, recognizing Lula's victory, which is, which is good because uh, Bolsonaro was, was, I believe still is, uh, refusing to recognize it. Uh, so, so, you know, Trudeau does deserve credit for that, but this is not, this was not Trudeau's, no matter what the tweet says, this is not Trudeau's preferred uh, uh, direction of things, nor corporate Canada's uh, preferred uh, uh, direction. 
And so it, it, it does offer some, uh, it offers real hope. I mean, first of all, the, you know, the regime change efforts in Venezuela are done. They've now been done for a while, but, uh, but, but uh, Canada's the Lima group and that, that's, all, that's all collapsed. And, uh, and hopefully we're gonna have some positive, some, you know, with, especially with Mexico also having a, a sort of social democratic uh, leader that the, the, the ability to really go in a, you know, to shift directions uh, with regards to uh, the OAS and, uh, you know, is, uh, is real, real possibility of making some serious strides on that front, which is, which is quite, quite uh, important in terms of uh, offering weakening U.S. hegemony in the region. The Maple published an interesting um, article, maybe five or six days ago, titled Canada Propped Up Venezuelan AstroTurf Group Linked to Crumbling Interim Government Note Confirms. And so Canada, the Canadian government pay, uh, uh, put up, uh, I think it was $300,000 or something like that uh, for, for this uh, group headed up that one of Juan Guaido's ministers led, uh, you know, Juan Guaido being the you know, interim president, the sort of fake president that Canada and the US have been recognizing for now closing in on four years. And so this is a, this is a, a you know, confirmation of what we knew, which was that Canada has been funding the opposition in, in Venezuela. And this is a pretty uh, a clear example of direct funding to Juan Guaido's uh, uh, crowd and you know, he, one of his ministers. And it's all under the feminist, it's all under their feminist uh, foreign policy, their feminist aid, their feminist assistance policy. Um, in an interview with uh, the, the, uh, one of the directors of Truth to the Powerless, an investigation into Canada's foreign policy, uh, Pitisana, I've talked about this uh, six part documentary series on Canadian foreign policy, very good documentary series that people should, uh, should uh, uh, look into. Um, in this interview, Pitisana says that a CBC reporter wrote a review of the six part series, but then the editor blocked it. Um, so the, the, um, uh, the fact that the CBC would, would spike a, uh, story on, um, on, uh, a review of the six part documentary series, uh, is, is, uh, unfortunate and, uh, reflective of their bias, uh, within the media. Yesterday or the day before, um, Trudeau marched in Ottawa with uh, protesters uh, against the Iranian government, which is um, interesting. Um, it's not every day that the prime minister of a country joins protests against another government. Uh, it's reflective of some interesting dynamics on Iran. Sorry, having some technical issues. Um, and, uh, but the, but so Trudeau marched in the protest. And this Iran, the Iran issue was really, it started to get uh, pretty, pretty out of control. Uh, more, you know, more Canadian condemnation. Uh, Freeland and uh, Melanie Jolie signed this international letter that was published in New York Times, criti critical of the Iranian government, and and uh, so there's a dynamic, and uh, there's a dynamic that I think it, it's 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 just kind of remarkable how one-sided the whole discussion on this Iran question is. And, and I have been focusing on other issues. So I haven't really, and as I said previously, I haven't really been as sort of fo have following things as close as I, I may have liked to be. Um, but it's clear that there's, there's, there's a whole 
side to this question that's just being completely left off. I, I came across a rabble story, rabble.ca, the left-wing website that I published, uh, published lots of stuff on, on Iran. Uh, it actually was published about 10 days ago, but I just saw it two days ago, yesterday, two days ago. And it, it's uh, titled Iran, Understanding the Dynamics of the Protests in Iran. And it's basically an interview with uh, Kaveh Sharous, who, who they describe as a lawyer and human rights activist. Well, <clears throat> this guy's actually a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurie Institute, right? The McDonald Laurie Institute is a right wing, well known right wing think tank. Very, very rarely would Rabble ever publish. Uh, a story, I mean, maybe one time quote somebody from McDonald Institute, but to have a whole story based upon a whole article based on an interview would, is basically unheard of on Rabble. And in this interview, I mean, it's just like he basically everything that should put out like a, you know, red flag to, you know, a left winger. The guy says, you know, all oh, Iranians hate the fact that the Iranian government supports resistance to Israel, supports Hamas or Hezbollah, or, you know, they, all this business about uh, sanctions having an impact, oh, that's nothing, there's no san sanctions, don't matter. Oh, just, just, just like all, any, you know, just be obvious red flag to anybody who understands any of the geopolitics going on here. And yet they just publish it without nothing. Um, same thing, uh, Spring, Spring Magazine, left-wing publication that I publish that regularly, is titled Iran's Uprising, a Revolution from Below. And the story says, the current revolutionary moment in Iran is led by the Iranian women, workers and students in the country who are fighting for their basic human rights and the removal of an oppressive state it is incumbent on the Canadian left to support this movement and respond to their calls for solidarity, amplifying the voices of the protests and putting pressure on the Western governments, including the Canadian state, to impose diplomatic and media sanctions on the Iranian state and remove the ability of Iranian state actors and their affiliates to engage in business and financial tra transactions in their countries. So it's <clears throat> very clearly saying there should be imposed diplomatic and media sanctions on the Iranian state and remove, uh, you know, the ability of state actors. So calling for sanctions, calling for diplomatic isolations. Well, Canada doesn't have diplomatic relations with Iran. That goes back a decade. Trudeau broke his promise to restart diplomatic relations with Iran. That even in 2019, the NDP pushing for restarting diplomatic relations with Iran large numbers from the, the Iranian community signed petition calling for restarting diplomatic relations with Iran. That article in spring then says no Western intervention supporting self-determination. But just above, you said you want this like diplomatic sanction, economic sanction, but then you're saying no Western intervention. Um, and it actually even mentions, it says, under Stephen Harper's government imposed harsh economic sanctions on Iran, which collapsed its currency and gravely impacted the lives of Iranians. Very, quite contradictory uh, uh, positions are taken. So one hand, you got to have sanction, you got to diplomatic isolate. On the other hand, we recognize that sanctions <laughs> have had uh, uh, deleterious effects on, uh, on people. Uh, Midnight, uh, uh, Midnight Mag, uh, Midnight Sun Mag, um, Todd Gordon is associated, another uh, left-wing publication. They also published a piece, Iran, a history of violence and a revolution in the making. That, uh, you know, ignore sanctions. There's a piece I saw in Jacobin four or five days ago. Sanctions are basically ignored. Uh, it's remarkable, quite frankly, to see how one-sided this, this depiction of what's going on in Iran is and how <clears throat> the forces in this country that have been looking for, you know, breaking off diplomatic relations, looking for sanctioning, uh, 
that basically want Canada to go to war with Iran, they're just sort of like left out of, of the whole uh, question. And that's, you know, the Israel lobby. The Israel lobby, as uh, uh, Thomas Juno, a establishment a Canadian academic pointed out, that's who blocked when the Trudeau government, Minister Dion, and even Freeland wanted to restart diplomatic relations with Iran because there's some, some Canadian companies that like Bombardier here in Montreal that want uh, this, wanted to sell or thought they could sell some aircraft. Um, it was the Israel lobby that blocked it. People like Kotler, Anthony Housefather, they were able to um, mobilize to push back against that. And like I said, even in 2019, you had um, a push strong push to restart diplomatic relations. And then basically what happened is that the Americans killed uh, General Soleimani in Iraq, the Iranian general, just you know, openly assassinated a top Iranian official in a third country. And then uh, whatever it was, a week or so later, a few days later, the Iranian uh, military blew up an aircraft with, um, they were worried, I guess, that there was um, that there was like an attack, an American attack against the country, and they blew up an aircraft that had lots of Canadians, Iranian Canadians, on it, and that has now that spun a whole process of just kind of like the Iranian community, um, and there's lots of evidence that that Israel lobby players like Erwin Kotler and stuff like that are, have really supported. The victims of the um, the plane, uh, the fam the, uh, the the family members' victims uh, have they really supported sort of building up that group, and and they have become clearly in the past uh, two years the that kind of line within the Iranian community has become if if not hegemonic pretty close to which is interesting because the Iranian Canadian Congress the people who who got elected there was a real battle and the, and the sort of the people who wanted to, you know, maximum pressure on Iran, they lost, they lost quite clearly. And that election I think was uh, about a year and a half ago or something like that. Um, so it's interesting to see some of that, that division within the Iranian community and see some of, some of the forces, the political forces that are pushing a, a, a certain uh, direction. And now we have a point where like Trudeau is like, you know, going to uh, demonstrations, um, uh, you know, like these Iran solidarity demonstrations. It's all a little bit, uh, <clears throat> a little bit odd to uh, to see. You know how far this is all going, um, but uh, you know who know who knows where, where we'll go uh, uh, go next. The Russians yesterday uh, announced that they they shot down drones and they're claiming that there was Canadian made uh, navigation modules in the drones. They uh, the Russians are using uh, these attack over Crimea and of course attacking Crimea from the Russian perspective is 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 a, is an escalation and the Russians have made that clear repeatedly. The Russians are using this to uh, justify breaking the or ending the uh, the grain export agreement that was signed uh, three months ago or so. It's not clear if they're hyping up the Canadian element in these drones as part of a certain justification for the um, for ending the uh, the the grain uh, export uh, agreement. Uh, Le, uh, Journal de Montréal on uh, Sunday, they published an article about the Canadian Special Forces in Ukraine. It's an interesting article that basically suggested that they're probably what Canadian Special Forces are doing in the Ukraine is assisting with a, a sniper, long range sniper training and execution even. Canadians are are known for having the like the longest sniper kill ever was a Canadian Special Forces, and a number I think I don't know, they they go into some numbers, but you know a handful of the longest sniper kills ever are Canadian 
military are are um, responsible for those. So they're sort of known as being particularly good with these long range sniper rifles. One of them they, in a story says that that uh, it's over three kilometers. So by Montreal, if you were in the old port and then you were atop of the mount of Montreal, that's the distance they can they can kill somebody with, which is completely wild to to think about. But but uh, this is what the story uh, pointed out. And this is interesting. I mean, they, what, what they were, the story points out, which I actually knew, uh, but you know, you forget is that so Canada's training mission in Iraq, it was a training mission, it was a training mission, training mission. And then when they, they're a Canadian uh, soldier kills somebody over three kilometers away, they boast about it because they want to, you know, give the pride to the Canadian military where the greatest give the kill people three kilometers away. But this is in a training mission. So you're admitting that you just like killed somebody from three kilometers away. But again, this is, you're framing this as a training mission. So the story kind of goes into some of that, which is a little bit interesting. And um, uh, also, you know, Canada announced some more sanctions, but there was another announcement that Trudeau made that I thought was quite interesting. Um, uh, he opens up a sort of discussion that I find a little bit interesting. And I don't really know what it means ultimately, but they, at the Ukra Ukrainian Canadian Congress in Winnipeg, a couple of days ago, Trudeau announced the Ukraine sovereignty bonds. Um, that of, where the Canadian government's going to back people buying these bonds that are going to go to supporting the Ukrainian government. And that right away brings to mind for me, like the when I was young, like I don't know, 10 years old, the whole like, Canada savings bond and the sort of nationalist, it was a kind of like nationalist type. Uh, um, type uh, PR or sort of promotion of these bonds that you should buy them. And, um, and it, 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 it brings to mind a question of something I thought about writing way towards the start of the Russian invasion uh, of this whole nationalism question and how the war in Ukraine, like it seems pretty clear to me that it has, it has very much elicited Ukrainian nationalism country that was, you know, regionally, ethnically diverse, that there has been, I think it's probably exaggerated in our media, but there has been a develop, development of Ukrainian nationalism out of that, that uh, because in response to the Russian invasion, which is not, you know, surprising. That's, the, you know, nationalism is often <laughs> in response to, you know, invasions and wars by their countries. And at the same time, of course, there has been a stoking of Russian nationalism, I think, within Russia. But the more interesting question for us is, is what about Canadian nationalism? And how is this Ukraine war, what's it done with regards to Canadian nationalism? And I think it has um, sort of stoked this nationalism in this country. And like our political ethos, I, I think I've mentioned this previously, our political ethos is that we are at war with Russia, that we're at war in Ukraine. It's kind of a weird one we, where we, we don't really admit it. And the people who act like we're at war, they have that sort of, you know, yes or no, us and them kind of attitude. Um, they will never admit that we're at war because then that complicates the whole picture of just Russian aggression against Ukraine. And it makes it more of like a proxy war and a more of a NATO versus Russia kind of question. Um, but but there is this clearly this ethos in Canadian political life that we are at war, and we see that in the House of Commons, right? Early on, the House of Commons unanimously endorses this is a genocide, right? Like that Russia's committing, and uh, there's this element of it all that's uh, this sort of like you know you know Canadian goodness of Canada in opposition to the Russian barbarians, this sort of good good versus evil stuff. There's even sort of um, economic and ecological and energy kind of nationalism that's stoked. So, for instance, the Bay du Nord, the part of how Christian Freeland promoted it within cabinet was this whole like, you know, energy security. This is a huge increase of uh, oil extraction in uh, Newfoundland and uh, up to up to a billion barrels, somewhere like 300 million and between 300 million and a billion barrels. Of, of new extraction that they uh, okayed uh, five, six months ago. Um, 
also, you know, there's some of this sort of the rhetoric around the, no the North and Arctic sovereignty, which of course, you know, eliminates the indigenous um, um, question of, you know, sovereignty of, of, the, of the, that territory. Um, so, so it seems to me that the war in Russia has very much elicited, elicited um, a sort of Canadian nationalism, which is, uh, I think, kind of interesting. And this whole, this whole uh, Ukraine sovereignty bonds backed by the Canadian government, to me, kind of reinforces this, this, uh, this idea of how, you know, Canadian nationalism being, being um, developed, stoked in the midst of this, uh, uh, this horrific war in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, and that's it. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. And uh, people have uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, uh, feel free. I think I probably have my tech problem again. Um, but I don't see anyone raising their hands. Oh. Uh, B. Sanzu, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Uh, Eve, I just wanna, uh, with respect to Haiti, there's another angle that I think we should look at, right? Which I only became aware of like today. And that is the timing of uh, Blinken's visit, right? Uh, you know, we are the, last country on the G2, G7 tour that he's visited. The, the president has not you know, done the customary thing that US presidents always do vis-a-vis -vis come to, to, to Ottawa. And you know, put together with the whole plan that they have in place, no doubt, uh, the UN resolution, all the rest of it. But there's yet another angle. And that is that unlike the uh, Republicans whose former prime minister, uh, President Trump, actually called call Haiti a shithole country. Uh, the Democrats don't do that. They need the black American vote. So to what extent I wonder is the timing of all this, like Ariel uh, uh, Henri has been in power for what, eight, nine months at least. Um, how much is it all tied to the, uh, the, the midterm uh, elections, you know, which is just at the doorstep? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I hope I'm not being conspiratorial, but it seems to me that oh, this is this isn't all just coincidental. Uh, you know, the kind of pieces have to fit together, especially with respect to the timing. So, anyway, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't think it has to do with American elections. Uh, I think it has more to do with the disintegration in Haiti and specifically the mass protests. Uh, so I think that the, the, the mission, the objective is to basically suppress the protests and, and maintain our Henri, who likely wouldn't stay on uh, without backing. That's my, that's my sense of what the, the, the motivation of the mission is. And, and, I, and I think there is an element of the, the U.S. empire does view, um, you know, they, they want domination and control, but they do, you know, with being the empire, there is some, I don't want to exaggerate this element because this is kind of how it's framed in the media, but I think there is an element that is sort of like, we take responsibility for things uh, disintegrating. And things clearly have disintegrated in Haiti from the standpoint of capitalism, from the standpoint of the Haitian elite, right? Uh, that's this is that's not the, the 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 extent of the insecurity and the extent of the 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 uh, disruption of of uh, daily life is not good from the standpoint of business and corporate profits. That doesn't mean that the Haitian elite aren't you know, central in explaining it all and that they're not even there than they are. They're involved in like, you know, funding different gangs that are part of the insecurity problem. And then at the more macro level, they're, you know, they're different, they're anti-democratic and their whatever policies, positions have, you know, created the context in which 
but but I, I don't think I don't think this is I, I totally agree with you that the the American government, unlike Donald Trump, who can even maybe excite his base by by like demonizing Haiti and sort of making derogatory comments towards Haiti, that's not that's not the, the sort of the smart play from the Democratic Party. Uh, they they want to do their you know anti Haitian um, measures in a more sort of uh, uh, liberal and and whatever kind of way, but uh, but yeah. So I think I think it's in large part to do with um, this the situation in Haiti. Two sides: one, the disintegration; the other side, the mass uh, the mass protests. Okay, so if I could just follow up. So if I get you right, then I, I see your point now. Uh, the are you suggesting that the situation, the disintegration, is at, at at that point, as opposed to let's say a month ago or or two months ago, that you know something sort of needs to be done, or because I'm I'm kind of just thinking like I can't let go of the idea of you know the old adage that you know everything foreign policy is domestic, right? Um, you know, even in Canada, like why look at the, where's the conservatives on this? Right. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that adage. I'll be, I don't okay. buy that adage. I don't, I don't think like there's a lot of rhetoric about, you know, the Haitian community, like Canada gets involved in Haiti because the Haitian community BS. BS. Okay. Uh, they're, they right now what they're doing on that front, they're Emmanuel Dubul, the only Haitian, uh, you know, Diaspora. Yeah, he came out to support it. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's just part of the Liberal Party's PR strategy. That's not the right. Haitian community. The Haitian community majority is against a mili okay. military intervention. And, and, and it's clear that they, the, the dominant media gives voice to those within the Haitian community that, that you know, say, yes, Canada do intervene. And they, and they marginalize in all kinds of different ways those voices that say, no, we, we don't want Canadian imperialism in Haiti. Um, ah, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the the diaspora uh, Haitian community in let's say in Quebec, but it would be the the international aid uh, workers and the so forth of the Quebec mainstream society, not the Haitians, but the Quebecers, because the money gets circulated. You know the billions and whatever that we spend. Yeah, no, no, and and there and there and there there is an element of that. There is an element of the NGO world that sort of like, <clears throat> whips up a a kind of interventionist. Uh, thinking and 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 uh, outlook, no no doubt, but even that when you when you get back to that, like that, it's the government that's got the power on that, right? They have control of the purse strings. They have the the the, the dominant channel to the to the main media, and so uh, yes, there is an intervention. I mean, I think you're right. There is a sort of like what do we call it, like a humanitarian interventionist ethos within Quebec. Uh, political life vis-a-vis -vis Haiti, right? Not, you know, in general, but particularly in Haiti, it's almost entirely in Quebec. All the NGOs are, they have a relationship with Haiti based upon a supposed uh, linguistic affinity. Um, so there is a, there is a, you know, an, an element to that there. Uh, and I think that does play a role around the, around the edges. And when I talk, talked about like the idea of the American empire and, and sort of taking on responsibilities as, as you know, and that there is an element of that that is tied to the sort of, you know, the NGO world and, and you know, when things do really get out of control and, you know, the echoes of that kind of, kind of um, uh, campaigning or thinking. But, but, uh, but yeah, I think that, that, um, that this is more about some very specific, the protests in Haiti specifically, uh, are part of motivating the why, the why, the now. I think they have been wanting to read, they never really wanted to leave, right? The minister, mm -hmm. they, they never really wanted the UN mission to leave. They basically wanted it to continue. And there was opposition within the UN. Um, but now I think it was just to play one other video. I tried to, wanted to play it earlier on. I okay. another disruption video that we have uh, that uh, Laurel, who is a, uh, a regular on the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour that we did, uh, at a symposium, uh, arm symposium a couple of days ago. I'll just show this quickly. No to the arms industry, no to funding more weapons, no to the Canadian Hmm. 
public et puis euh, les choses. Uh, okay, I don't know what's going on there. I'm not... Hey, some of the biggest weapons companies in the world. You, you, you are profit. No to the arms industry. No to funding more weapons. No to the Canadian government subsidizing and promoting the arms industry. This conference is sponsored by Lockheed Martin, L3 Harris, CAE, some of the biggest weapons companies in the world. You, you, you are profiting, you are profiting, profiting off the horrors in the Ukraine. You are fueling, you are fueling the conflicts around the world. NATO, no to NATO, no to NATO. NATO expansion is part of what's led to this horrible conflict in Ukraine. It's the arms companies that have been promoting NATO expansion, promoting operability and bringing... No, no, to, no to the arms industry. Fund light rail, not weapons. Fund buses, not weapons. Social economy, not more weaponry. Shame on you. Shame on the federal government for promoting the weapons industry. Shame on the federal government for promoting the weapons industry. Shame on you for promoting more killing. Say no! Say no to more weapons! <laughs> looks, like, looks like he disrupted a meeting. So that was a, that was a, uh, that was actually, it was called the uh, Canadian Defense and Security Market Symposium. And I was there with Laurel. I'm not sure if Laurel's, uh, Laurel's uh, with us tonight, uh, but she had that great uh, no, no NATO sign. And, uh, and it was, uh, yeah, anyways, it was a, uh, What's some worthwhile little uh, little protest? But yeah, so is there any other questions? Comments? What's happening with the with the uh, harassment of uh, grain shipments from uh, from the Ukraine? That uh, the, the R Russia protested and said that they uh, they would they would have to have to stop while 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 the harassment's going on. What's happening there? There's been nothing in the press recently. Well, the, very little in the press anyway. Just today, the Russians announced that they're going to end the. And the agreement. So but that was because of harassment. They, they were they were being by Zelensky and company. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I was saying earlier that the 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 Russians are saying that they shot down. Uh, I think they said like a dozen or some significant number of drones that tried to attack some facilities in Crimea. That. And this is the business of Canadian. There was Canadian components as part of these drones, oh, okay. according to the Russians, and uh, and they're saying they're they're sort of using this as the uh, pretext or reason, depending on, for ending the the uh, grain agreement. Really? I'm of the, I haven't followed this very closely, but I'm I'm of the it, it, the Russians are claiming that the Ukrainians haven't really fulfilled. There's two parts. They didn't fulfill. The Russians are not being allowed to send their fertilizer and the sanctions and different stuff that, that was part of it, that the Russians are supposed to benefit from it. And that <clears throat> saying that's happened, but also that the, um, the grain that the, the Ukrainians framed as like getting grain to, you know, poor countries that are being hit by starvation and food insecurity. But in fact, almost all of the Ukrainian grain has gone to wealthier countries. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, pre I'm prepared to believe both elements of that, the Russian, that, that there are sanctions and their fertilizer and other elements of the agreement that they haven't lived up to allowing the Russians to export that. Uh, and it also makes sense to me that the Ukrainians didn't necessarily get the, they're just trying to make money. They're not, they're shipping the, the product to where they can make money, not based upon- The most money, yeah. But, but the, <laughs> but the, I also make sense to me that the Russians seem to have gone to a a more aggressive, if you want to call it, um, 
policy of knocking out electricity and basically, you know, trying to weaken Ukraine in a more maximalist kind of way. And from the Russian perspective, why would they want Ukraine to be able to make money on its exports? That, of course, that's, you know, that well, strengthens Ukraine. And so, so to me, what my, my sense of where the Russians are going and where this is, this is all going is this getting, you know, this is all part of the escalation. And from the Russian standpoint, this is, this is a PR question and they don't, they, they don't, the agreement was a PR in part was a PR exercise with regards to the global South, with regards to the UN and, and, you know, wanting to put the blame for the food insecurity, not on Russia, but on the sanctions on, you know, NATO oh. uh, policy. Um, and so the Russians sort of are going to a more kind of aggressive policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and they're not seeing the benefit for themselves. So, why not go that well, there, there's, a, there's a lot of Russians and uh, living in, uh, of course, in, in, in the eastern townships, but there, the Russian population is there. And I, 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 I don't think that, uh, that, that Russia is interested in, uh, in curtailing in any way um, uh, Ukraine shipments, wheat shipments, uh, you know? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I say, unfortunately. They're not, they're not out to, to, to bankrupt Ukraine. What they're out to do is to prevent NATO from establishing. No, I think, I think, there. no, I don't, I think geostrategically that doesn't, that, I don't, I think Russia wanted and wants, wanted a relationship of economic inter, interdependence and relations with Ukraine. That, I think that that was Russia's preference for obvious reasons. <laughs> Uh, after the 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 end of the USSR, because obviously instability on your border is not usually very good for you, and to have you know you oh, usually benefit. But but I think that once the Ukraine is basic NATO. basically a hub of opposition to Russia, and that's what it's been turned into, and certainly since 2014 in a quite clear way. Once that's the case, I. I understand Russia's geostrategic interest in having the place be weak. That's that's preferable, right? If, if it's going to be an en if it's going to be an enemy on your border, you prefer to have a weak enemy than a strong enemy. That, that doesn't seem particularly complicated idea. And so the and then and then you know early in the war, I I, I think the Russia was fighting in a way oh. it was designed still to maintain a sort of a certain degree of fraternity. With Ukraine and sort of like figure out a you know let's negotiate let's you know make, keep Ukraine neutral and et cetera et cetera, but as as that seems to be going further being less and less likely, the and then when you know Ukraine escalates to certain things like the the bridge attack in Crimea, then increasingly Russia goes towards a a policy of okay we'll just we'll make it hurt. Well, I. I didn't. It's, it's not a military question. It's a question of uh, of, of the well being of the Ukrainians, uh, a large chunk of whom are Russian, and um, I, I I think you, you you're confusing the two things, uh, the, the well being of of other citizens there. The Russia has no interest in in, uh, in compromising, versus the real danger of uh, of um, uh, NATO and the United States shipping in huge amounts of. Um, uh, of weaponry at, at an increased rate. Yeah, I mean, so, I think that is the, that's the Russia's geos. I think I think it's it's, it's, it's the Zelensky ploy to to embarrass Russia to uh, to 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 hinder the uh, the uh, shipment of uh, Ukrainian um, uh, wheat. He's yeah. capable of anything, you know. But I mean, I think that the the policy of like knocking out electricity and stuff like that that the that uh, Russia is going towards is, well, is a policy of of uh, of just weakening the Ukrainian state and and uh, so. We but are, 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 are there any other questions or comments uh, that? Uh, some uh, so, somebody Larry had uh, had had his hands up. Is is he still here, Larry? Do you still want to ask your question? Going once, going twice. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to know, like, uh, what's your opinion on uh, Bolsonaro? Do you think he's actually going to concede 
you think the U.S. and Canada will be working behind the scenes to support him if he does do a coup? Interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know enough about. I don't know enough about the, you know, Brazilian politics. I, I saw that um, Lula met with um, Alberto Fernandez, the uh, the president of uh, of Argentina, came to. Uh, I don't know if it was Rio or Sao Paulo or where where Lula is. And uh, and I, I assume the fact that that happened that quickly, that's trying to create a whole sense of it's over, Bolsonaro, you've lost, we, you know, international support, whatever kind of thing like that. Um, so, and, and, and that would be in large part vis-a-vis -vis the military, the Brazilian military and what the Brazilian military might do. But, uh, and I've also seen that there have been like blockades or protests in different parts of Brazil that are, you know, you know Bolsonaristas that are trying to, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know how far they're willing to go, right? But they're, they're trying to uh, sort of oppose the loss. Um, but I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how far. He seems like a pretty, uh, pretty extreme uh, character. You know, I, I, I don't think that you know, the Lula is a, is a threat to, to the US-led uh, world. There's, there's many examples where the Americans were not happy obviously with regards to Latin America integration, but also with um, efforts to you know, negotiate with Iran, for instance, with Americans that Lula instigated, I, I don't know what years exactly it was, but, um, but we're, are they, you know, how far they're willing to go uh, in doing that? I, you know, Bernie Sanders had a, I think there's a petition that uh, I don't know how many senators signed, but there was like sort of like some, more or less a petition said that if, if, if uh, Lula wins, the Americans have to immediately recognize uh, the victory and kind of alluded to the US role in the coup against uh, Goulart in uh, 64 in Brazil. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know how far Bolsonaro will go with it. Uh, Eve, somebody, uh, uh, one moment, let me get that question back. Uh, there was another John that had a question. If, uh, if Canada, I'll read it out. If Canada breaks away from, from slavish devotion to U.S. foreign policy, especially NATO, climate change and the disappearance of sea ice puts maritime defense of the sea shelf into our hands. Also maritime search and rescue. What does a progressive foreign policy that also defends maritime natural resources in the north look like hmm, hmm. uh <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> i mean i don't think a progressive policy that's defending natural resources in the north like what what do we mean do we mean access to, to possible oil extraction up there do we mean i mean the the, the progressive option would be this to not have uh the extraction of most of those uh resources uh, and and the progressive option would be that you know climate change doesn't 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 uh, make that uh, f more feasible or, or feasible uh, but but I think at a kind of more macro level or if I understand that that question of you know where does if if Canada breaks from NATO or NORAD or its alliance with the US does is Canada then going to be vulnerable to you know, foreign military intervention or something to that effect. I don't know if that's kind of what it's getting at. No, no actually, actually, that's not, it was not so much that. I was the one that asked the question. Uh, there, the question was, if there is going to be an independent Canadian foreign policy and we take responsibility, proper progressive environmental accountability for our continental shelf and the resources that are there, um, Part of that is naval patrols. This is the, the current international community, whether you like them or not, will recognize, uh, won't recognize us unless we have naval patrols or other, some other way of enforcing our desire for protection of the environment in the North. What does that look like from a progressive foreign policy perspective? But, but when you say like protecting our resources, what, what, what do you mean concretely? Well, uh, picture a disaster scenario where the, uh, 
the Danes or the Russian or any other Scandinavian power says, well, here's an oil shelf I can drill. It's 13 miles offshore and we claim 200 miles. How do we enforce how do we enforce our desire to not have oil drilled on the Arctic shelf that we think is ours in the absence of our own military patrol vessels? Well, so then, so then the progressive policy would be have some, some weaponry to block any extraction. It Fair be- enough, yeah. But I, I'm just saying that it, it, it's, uh, I, I guess where I'm going with that, Eve, because uh, I, I love your writing, long time fan, first time caller. Um, there's a lot of, critique and really trenchant and good critique, but uh, the Canadian policy alternatives, uh, Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives puts out every year an alternative bu- uh, alternative federal budget and says, here's what a budget should look like if progressives ran it. I'm wondering if there's an equivalent if you or the CFPI or others are thinking of putting together an, an alternative Canadian foreign policy and what that would look like as, as something to propose as opposed to just oppose. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that is a real that's a serious conundrum, because I, I think yeah. that most of the progressive foreign policy is less. Right? Do less. <laughs> Fair in, enough. In the, in the left right book, I, I go into that question of left right uh, marching the beat of Imperial Canada, where I basically put forward the, you know, the do no harm kind of medical kind of uh, uh, framing. And, and, you know, like, you know, the aid question, okay, you know, in, in um, like equalization payments, as we have within Canada, if we were to internationalize that through the UN or structure where the aid is not, a, then becomes a tool of like domination, but it becomes a tool of genuine, you know, equalization, certain degree of solidarity, that I'm very sympathetic to that idea. But as aid is currently organized, yeah more of a geopolitical tool, a corporate tool or whatever, right? So, so um, mostly it's like less Canada in the world is what is what the actual progressive policy is. I, I do believe, like again, I repeat, I, I do think that there is, you know, there's definitely a role for, you know, international like uh, equalization payments or variations of that, right? Which would go more in the do, you know, not do less, but do more kind of direction. But with regards to you know the icebreakers and you know using Canadian naval icebreakers to protect some of that terrain, um, uh, you know sure, but it's just it's so much of this is wrapped up in actually just being an appendage of the American Empire and all our military spending is really genuinely that that it's it's very hard to. Um, get into the policy terrain of saying we should spend more of our, you know, rather than spending a military budget on the fighter jets, we should spend it on, you know, uh, naval vessels, right? I mean, some sometimes they, and I don't, I see so much of the Canadian, what the Canadian military is about. Like, I, if, you know, the redirecting money within the Canadian military, I would take, I would take the money and, you know, there's all these Canadian military bases that have unexploded ordnance and all kinds of, you know, chemical weapons and all kinds of horribly ecological um, things that are buried, that are been trashed. And a lot of it's on indigenous land. And, and, you know, so the military budget should go into retraining those who are in the military to, you know, reclaiming that terrain, ecologically speaking, so it can give and be given back to first nations, right? That would, that's a real, that's a, that's a sort of genuinely progressive model for the Canadian military as part of a process of, of, of if not eliminating, drastically reducing the size and scope of the Canadian military. Um, but no, in terms of the concrete on the north and, and what type of vessels is better, I, you know, I don't know enough about the icebreakers that I know we're purchasing icebreakers as we, as we speak. As we I don't know enough about like, how genuinely they are about um, protecting sovereignty and how much they're about um, enhancing the U.S. empire. But that hey, is. Eve, do you have energy for two more questions possibly or? Yeah, I think that, that, sh- that, would, that should be it because uh, yeah. I got Halloween, some Halloween stuff. Okay, then uh, before, but then uh, yes, uh, somebody uh, in the comments section, Normand asks, Latin American left, good inspiration for a Quebec and Canadian progressives, and, the, and, and was asking if there's any, you know, relation between 
the NDEAP and the uh, Workers' Party. Um, my question uh, is, uh, is uh, yeah, just uh, j just in general, are, are you, uh, you know, are you know, do you sort of feel like me? You're kind of sort of uh, upset about the uh, entire discourse on Iran because I'm even shocked at at communist publications and their we need to stand with the workers of Iran, with the feminists of Iran, with the, with this and that movements in Iran. When and yeah, in in spirit, I do do that, but 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 but, but it's I'm just kind of shocked at how so many supposedly left leaning people, even communists, are de facto sort of recycling a lot of propaganda on uh, Iran. Well, first answer with regards to the NDP, I mean, I know that Nikki Ashton was down in uh, in Brazil uh, via the Progressive International, and she she did an event, I think, on the weekend, um, I think maybe with Jeremy Corbyn or some other <clears throat> Progressive International uh, folks around Brazil. Uh, yeah, with regards to Iran, I mean, I, I guess I said that in you know previous uh, Foreign Policy Hour or, or two two sessions ago or something. Um, I, 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 I am uh, ambivalent, very ambivalent. To, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, you know, forcing women to wear a veil. Um, uh, that's, you know, I'm, I, I oppose that. Uh, I think that the theocratic nature of the government in Iran is, is certainly not to my liking, uh, clearly repressive. Uh, anti-ecological, um, somewhat neoliberal. I don't think as neoliberal as some other um, uh, governments. It's, but this is, you know, coming from not knowing that much about internal Iranian politics. There's, there's a lot to not like about the Iranian government. Um, there's some elements. I, I am sympathetic to a lot of its resistance policies in the hemisphere, you know, in, or in the region in in the in the Middle East. I think there's there's um, there's elements of that policy that we, and that's really why the U.S. and Canada and Israel want to want to uh, want regime change. It's not about women. It's not about the repressive nature, because clearly Saudi Arabia is more patriarchal and more repressive. Um, exactly. <laughs> it's so, so it's about it's about those sort of geostrategic, geopolitical uh, dynamics. That's the that's the the reason that the you know Justin Trudeau is marching, and we're getting all this sort of. Uh, outlook in our media, um, but uh, it is remarkable. What I what I find remarkable is the, you know, I'm thinking maybe you're trying to flush this out. I don't know. I thought it through well enough, but this this how much of of uh, like unrooted um, left international kind of thinking is. When I say unrooted, I mean you like the Canadian government's policy has to be the first and foremost consideration if you're protesting something international something in Canada right like that's what's it's not you're you're not you're not just like you, you're in Canada you you and you there's demands we made of the Canadian government do you agree that when Harper cut off was was a good thing for Harper to cut off diplomatic relations with Iran in 2012 was that a good thing and, and I think it clearly was not a good thing. It did not in any way come from a positive place and it didn't have a positive outcome. And even the liberals were calling for restarting diplomatic relations. That was the official policy of the Canadian government. And so, and again, like the NDP was raising that question in you know, 2019 even. And so what's happened that that's, that's now we say that like, that's not, that's wrong. Like, why does Canada only not have diplomatic relations with, I believe it's just Syria and Iran. Like Venezuela has got some complicated elements to it, right? But so, you know, if we're not gonna have diplomatic relations with Iran, shouldn't we also not have diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia? Um, so th these questions are, 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 they have to be, if you're, you're, you're campaigning on an issue in Canada, that has to be all like part of the consideration. So I, I'm just kind of, you know, this sort of abstract, like, like, let's solidarity with, with Iranians. And now, and then on top of that, you know, I, I have a, a friend in Vancouver, who's, I'm kind of, he's sending me messages from a, somebody from the Iranian community, who calls himself anti-imperial left wing, who's like, you know, basically, 
he's saying these like sort of conspiracy theories, in my opinion, about like the Iranian, the, you know, Washington and the Iranian government, they, you know, they're working together. They don't really oppose the Iranian government because the Iranian government is, you know, and it's craziness. I mean, like they're bombing, oh like they, they're assassinating Iranian scientists. They have vicious sanctions. They're bombing top Iranian officials in, 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 in Iraq. They, they're, they're, Israel's bombs Syria, like on like a couple times a week. And the justification, whether it's always true or not, but the justification is invariably, it's like they're, they're bombing Iranian targets. Um, you got, you know, this, the, 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 the cyber warfare, right? Destroying all these like, you know, computer systems in Iran. I mean, it's, it's like, it's a, you know, it's not maybe a full fledged war, but it's a definitely a low level war that's being waged against Iran for many years. And so the idea that like, you know, actually the Washington's in cahoots with the, it's just craziness. And, 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 and so there's, I mean, this is like a sort of left-wing uh, kind of, I think it's just sort of this left-wing justification for basically echoing the imperialist, let's bring in more sanctions, let's bring in, you know, let's push for foreign sponsored regime change. Maybe not foreign sponsored full throttle military regime change, but foreign spawn, that's the point of the sanctions is to hurt the Iranian economy to the point where people rise up to overthrow the government. That's open. Americans are not high. That's, you know, American officials have written about that kind of stuff, right? So in that situation, even if you don't like the Iranian government, I'm certainly not going to spend any of my time being like, let's support that effort. I mean, mostly what we should spend our time doing is trying to undercut that effort, but he certainly shouldn't be joining in and saying, um, you know, let's, let's do this. Um, so, but, but on that note, it's, uh, it's a, a, a bit past uh, seven o'clock and, uh, and I do have some Halloween related uh, things to do with um, the, little, the little ones. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming out uh, next week, same place, uh, same time. Take care. Have a good evening. <laughs> Shall we? Happy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs>